Alright, today is Wednesday, May 17th, and welcome to another economic discussion. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and this time around, we're gonna go back to Britain. And the reason is, we have a lot of British viewers, and they like when we talk about the British economy. And I did that a few weeks ago, when we criticized the Bank of England and uh, the spokesman, Hugh Pill, who urged the British public to accept being poor as inflation continues to rage in that country and of course the video was shared widely in social media by british users and hugh pill got ashamed and he came out this week saying that he admits he should have been more careful with his language after he faced criticism telling households they need to accept they are poorer and for the american viewers if you think that the federal reserve is bad wait till you see the bank of england the Bank of England is the worst central bank in the world right now, bar none. The level of incompetency is absolutely unbelievable. To begin with, the BOE was far too late to tackle the inflation problem. They watched inflation revving higher, and they were too late to the game in catching up with inflation. And even now, as we stand, the BOE remains way, way, way behind the curve in tackling the inflation problem. And instead, they decided to blame supply chains, Russia, Brexit, the death of the Queen, anything, but taking responsibility for not catching up with the inflation problem from the get-go. And now, of course, Mr. Pill from the BOE says that perhaps AI might help central banks make better decisions. In other words, maybe we should lose our jobs. Why are we paid, uh, I don't know, 500,000 pounds a year when AI can do the job? Even the BOE is now pumping AI and joining the AI mania. But perhaps he's right. AI could have been more competent than the BOE. Might have caught up with the inflation problem from the get-go instead of letting it go. And then catching up from behind, or it's pretty much impossible at this point to catch up with the inflation rate that's going on in the UK. And a major problem that perhaps the American viewers would not understand is in the UK, sure they have some fixed mortgage rates, but they adjust from time to time. They're not the 30 years fixed mortgage, which gives the Federal Reserve here the flexibility to raise rates without incurring a lot of damage to homeowners. And the same cannot be said in the UK, because if the BOE raises rates aggressively, mortgages will rise significantly higher. And this could cause economic devastation and push the economy into a depression. What's really important for the American viewers to understand about the British economy and what's going on with the BOE is how tied up these central banks are together. In other words, the talk here in the US that the Federal Reserve is done raising rates and they're going to pause in the next meeting. The problem is both the ECB and the BOE are now dependent on the Federal Reserve to tackle the inflation problem on their behalf. And it is a delicate act of balance. If the Federal Reserve does too much tightening, the value of the dollar will spike higher and the value of the British pound will go down. The impact of the dollar moving higher is lower commodities prices. The majority of them are priced in the US dollar, specifically oil. On the other hand, if the value of the pound gets crushed dramatically, then the purchasing power of the British consumer will collapse. And the effect of that is inflationary, because your pounds are going to buy less. Likewise, if the Fed takes a loose approach and pauses prematurely, and we see the value of the dollar moving down and the value of the British pound increasing, sure, it gives the British consumer more power when it comes to imports. But the drop in the dollar will increase the prices of commodities, which is also inflationary for the British consumer. So they're all tied up together. And when the Bank of England is out of ammo in fighting inflation, the only thing they can do is keep raising rates to catch up with the inflation rate, which is now standing at 10%. The Bank of England is not even at half this rate, pushing the rate all the way to 10% plus to tackle inflation. While it might solve the inflation problem, it will also devastate the British economy. So it is important for the American viewers to understand that the British economy and the BOE are now dependent on the Federal Reserve and their upcoming action. And with that understanding out of the way, let's dig more and see what's going on in the British economy and the incompetency by the BOE. And here it is, in focus tonight. Nothing to see here, says the BOE. Uh, what recession? There is no recession. It's not going to happen anymore. You know, the BOE has been wrong over and over and over about everything. The inflation projection, the recession outlook, GDP outlook, 
everything. They're wrong about everything. If the BOE says I'm going to die from cancer, I would probably have a giant smile on my face because I would live to 120 years old, healthy, no cancer, cancer free. That's how accurate the BOE is. And now all of a sudden the BOE has been saying that, oh, the inflation target of 2% will be reached by late 23, then it became early 24, the late 24, and now the BOE admits, oh, now it might be all the way to 25. You see, in November of 22, the projection by the BOE was that the inflation target will be reached, and this is a 2% target by the BOE, or oh, it will be met by a Q1 of 24. In the month of February of this year, they became even more optimistic, and they said it might happen even earlier, before 24. And lately, this month, all of a sudden, the Bank of England says, oh, it's not going to happen until 25. And perhaps in the next meeting, it's going to be 26. Can we believe anything from the BOE with their reliable accuracy rate? Well, the Bank of England has changed its outlook dramatically since inflation first breached the 2% target in May of 2021, including huge forecast adjustments in the past few months alone. Inflation is now 10.1%, and it will still be at 5.1% by year's end. Mind you, we have an inflation problem here in the US at a CPI, which is reading at 5% right now. In the UK, it's 10%. And this rosy outlook of going down to 5% by year end, can we even believe that? Even then, it will be higher than the current 4.9% rate in the US. The inflation overshoot and forecast U-turns are raising questions about the BOE's grasp of where the economy is headed, with its framework and recent track record currently under scrutiny in the parliament. Listen to this when it comes to inflation. Then, in May 21, outgoing BOE chief economist Andy Haldan warned against letting the inflation genie out of the bottle. Here comes uh, genius Andrew Bailey, Governor Bailey. He asked whether it's going to be persistent or not, question mark. Our view is that we don't think it is. So the warning sign was there. The BOE decided not to listen. In July of 21, Deputy Governor for Monetary Policy Ben Broadbent argued that the BOE should look through rising commodities prices and said he was not convinced that the current inflation in retail goods prices should in and of itself mean higher inflation 18 to 24 months ahead. It was not until April of 22 that Bailey conceded if you get shock after shock, then transitory. It doesn't look transitory. And what about now? Inflation is now embedded in wage setting and corporate pricing, the BOE said. That is because as inflation rises, employees and firms seek to recoup lost incomes. Duh. Bailey added that higher than expected underlying inflation reflects second round effects, quote unquote, caused by workers and companies chasing rising prices. When it comes to interest rates, then, after the BOE raised rates by half a percentage points in February of 22, Bailey said, it would be a mistake to extrapolate simplistically from what we have done today and assume that rates are now an inevitable long march upwards. About now, rates have risen for 12 meetings in a row to 4.5%, the highest level since 2008, and the most aggressive tightening cycle since the late 80s. And here's the most important one, the recession risk. Because I believe that we're going to have another one of those uh, then and now. When it comes to then, in August, the BOE predicted a five-quarter recession, starting in the final three months of the year. In October, Broadbent pushed back against market interest rate expectations, saying that should rates rise to 5%, the cumulative impact on GDP of the entire hiking cycle would be just under 5%, of which only around one quarter has already come through. The following month, the BOE warned, the UK faced a two-year slump, the longest on record. Even with rates just at 3%, the UK would be in a recession, it said. Well, they're not in a recession yet. Now, the economy has not contracted in any single quarter since the summer of last year. After raising rates Thursday and with a further increase to 4.7% built into the outlook, the BOE delivered its biggest forecast upgrade since independence in 1997. It now says there will be no recession, not even a single quarter of contraction. Uh-oh. They jinx it. Had they kept their mouths shut, maybe the UK would have averted recession. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be a depression in the UK. Forget about a recession. And it's official, folks. The Bank of England says nothing to see here with the highest inflation rate in any Western country at 10% plus. And with interest rates 
shy of 4.5%. Somehow, inflation will come down without producing any damage to the economy, not a single quarter of contraction. When history says, hold my beer. And here it is, the BOE's forecast in August 22 that the UK would be in a recession by this time this year. The same goes back in November and as late as February of this year, predicting that the UK economy would be in a recession. But it's not yet. So the Bank of England, instead of being uh, realistic or dependent on the data or the history, they decided to go ahead and upgrade the outlook for the British economy. It's not just going to be no recession. We're going to have a massive growth coming this year. This will be an absolute embarrassment to the BOE if we, let's say, second half of this year, we see a massive global recession worldwide, Britain included. What we know from history is when inflation rises to double digits territory, to guide it down to 2% from, let's say, 10% plus, this doesn't happen amicably. It usually happens in a massive recession, but somehow, magically, the BOE says it's going to happen with no recession. Not only that, but the journey from 10% plus to 2% in the inflation rate will be accompanied by economic growth. Wow. And here's a reminder for you that the UK economy is indeed in stagflation. The inflation rate stands at 10% plus, exceeding that of the Eurozone and the US by a wide margin. Food prices are skyrocketing in the UK, the highest since 1977. And you can see that commodities prices actually went down and food inflation is easing in many countries, but somehow in the UK is skyrocketing because the inflationary psychology is embedded in the economy. And to extract this inflationary psychology out of the economy, it requires a recessionary shock. Here's an example of the absurdity of food inflation in the UK. Take a look. Bye. 60 70 pence each and then we're, we're selling a red pepper for just under two quid for a red pepper miles and his brother run the greengrocers in beeston nottingham despite it being a 100 year old family run business he says in his lifetime he's never known things to cost so much i've paid this time of year uh, or this time of year i paid eight pounds for a box of tomatoes we're still paying 16 pounds for a box of tomatoes so that's 100% increase on this, this time last year, 100%. Miles says businesses like his only have two options, increase prices or take the loss. And again, a reminder, when we see food inflation going down, let's say in many other countries, including the US, they're not going down by a lot, they're still sticky, but they went down a bit for two reasons. Number one, we're seeing weakness in the US consumer. And unfortunately, a lot of consumers have to cut down even in food purchases. Number two, this is how bad the BOE is. It makes the Federal Reserve actually looks good. The Fed has been doing a better job, let's say, than the BOE in catching up with inflation by raising rates higher and higher. The BOE is far behind the game and therefore food inflation is loose. But keep in mind that there is the mortgage problem in the UK. If the BOE raises rates aggressively to tackle the inflation problem and push food prices down, this will come at the cost of mortgages skyrocketing for UK homeowners. And since the BOE's hands are tied in terms of raising rates, it's not just food inflation that is going loose. It's also rent inflation. It continues to rise higher. So we have a massive inflation problem in the UK. And with the cost of living surging higher, the consumer is getting squeezed. And therefore, there is a reaction. And the reaction is demanding higher wages. And we see the worst period of strikes since Margaret Thatcher in the UK. These strikes are costing the British economy a dire cost, tens of millions of pounds every single month. It used to be concentrated in transportation. Now it's widespreading to education, health, social work, public administration. There is a contagion in labor, demanding higher pay to cope up with the cost of inflation. The headline reads, UK public sector employees plan to raise pay by most since 2012. And we know that wage inflation, it is a symptom of the inflation problem, but it has a feedback loop in increasing the inflation problem. It becomes a vicious cycle. And at this point, it is too late for central banks to control inflation. The only remedy becomes a recession. The Chartered Institute of Personal Development, the CIPD, said expected median pay settlements in the public sector for the coming 12 months rose by 3.3%, up from 2% in the previous three months, and the highest level since records started in 2012. However, 
The gap between public and private employees' wage expectations remained wide, with those in the private sector expecting to raise pay by 5% in the coming year, unchanged from three months before. And now even the BOE acknowledges that there is a wage price spiral in the UK economy. So that's the inflation picture. It doesn't appear that inflation will go down anytime soon in the UK. What about the pace of economic activity? Because so long as you have the pace of economic activity intact, so far so good, at least for now. If the pace of economic activity is slowing down, then you have stagflation in the economy. Now, the Bank of England and the British government paints a rosy picture, arguing that despite rate hikes, they're not seeing any damage in the British economy. That the employment market remains intact. Yet when we look at the last payroll, we can see job losses across most sectors of the economy. Wholesales, retail, auto repair, accommodation, food services, construction, manufacturing, real estate, transportation, information, mining. All of these sectors lost jobs in the last report, with only education and energy production and supply adding jobs. So we already see the stagflation phenomenon happening in the UK economy, but the job is far from being done. With an inflation rate of 10% and a central bank rate of about 4.5%, the gap is too wide. We know, historically speaking, that central banks have to raise rates above the inflation rate to get the job done, meaning the Bank of England will have to double the current interest rate. We already talked about how unrealistic that is because it would blow up the entirety of the UK economy. It would cause a depression. So what is the choice right now? Do it, take a chance, cause a recession, maybe a depression, or let stagflation go and have the economy experience a slow, painful death. Well, according to the chief of the Bank of England, whatever pain British households are feeling right now, that is only one third the pain to come. Take a look. But it seems like, you know, a lot of people uh, looking at the headlines here, they'll have seen this, you know, biggest upgrade from the bank in, in, in a long time for the economic growth numbers. But they will be feeling, they'll be feeling some, the squeeze, and the squeeze is intensifying, and it's intensifying in part because of what the bank is doing, which yeah. is raising interest rates. Yes. And there's more of that pain to come through for a lot of households in terms of what they're going to be feeling with their interest rates yes. coming up. Is that right? Yes. Well, and the reason for that is that the mortgage market has changed a lot uh, in the, well, now nearly 20 years, actually, since there was the previous real tightening cycle of interest rates with interest rates going up. So, of course, we now have a, a much more fixed rate dominated mortgage market. I think around about 85 percent of mortgages in this country are now set over a, a period. Obviously, it can be you know, two years upwards, but five, seven years. What it means, though, is that these you know, mortgage costs are just... But, that's, but so how much of the pain have we had so far on that and how much has yet to come? Well, we think in terms of, a, in terms of resetting and adjustments, it's probably not more, about a third possibly comes so Only so a third far. so far I, of Obviously, by the way, it's, it's a bit more complicated because obviously as we raise rates, then it... it you know, yeah. But just in terms of what families can expect, so there is that still two thirds of the kind of interest rate related pain there's yet a, to come. There's quite a large number of, uh, quite a large proportion of mortgages yet to reset. And again, he says two thirds of the pain is still to come as mortgages reset to the current rate of the Bank of England. What if they have to raise the rate higher? because inflation is sticking and not coming down. Then maybe we've only seen one-tenth of the pain. And the reporter asked Andrew Bailey, can you relate to the pain the British households are experiencing right now? If you say that this is only one-third of the pain, take a look. Because, it's, because for a lot of people, again, you know, they're looking at you in this kind of gilt-edged room in the, in, in the middle of London. Yeah. And up around the country, people are really struggling right now. Yes. Do, do, you, do you see that and yes, relate with that? I do. And I'm very, very sensitive to this fact that yeah. this shock has reduced our national income through higher inflation. And, and, and say, I'm afraid the Bank of England doesn't have a tool to make that go away. We can, can't can make you help. Well, what we have to do is stop it becoming persistent. Right, but can you help with, there are particularly some families who are, you know, particularly struggling right now. Some people don't have mortgages, you know, some people have lots of savings. Actually, this has been not bad, relatively speaking, for some people. But for some people, it really has been quite yeah, tough. So can you, can you kind of focus on those people and really help? 
Well, I think it's not something I'm afraid that monetary policy can, can, can address because monetary policy is an economy-wide tool. I have to be So it's not for the bank, but it's for the government, the government to do well, something. Well, like it's not for me to prescribe what others, others should do. So somehow central banks cause the problem of inflation by practicing reckless monetary policy. But when it comes to the resolution, oh, that's not our responsibility at all. We can't do anything about it at all. Uh, talk to the government. Talk to the parliament. And the same is happening here in the U.S. Who caused the inflation problem? It's the Federal Reserve. When they are asked about what about the pain that the consumer is experiencing right now, the home unaffordability crisis, all of a sudden that's not their responsibility. When all what they've done is initiating the most insane tsunami of liquidity to respond to the pandemic, and what they did is they lifted asset prices, stocks and real estate for the wealthy, and they initiated the largest wealth transfer in the history of humanity. But then they washed their hands clean Oh, it's not our responsibility. We can't do anything about it. But you caused the problem. And in the case of the Bank of England, they have no shame at all. Andrew Bailey is still blaming the inflation problem on supply chains from the thing, the pandemic, and the war. As if the Bank of England did nothing at all in creating this problem. Take a look. And just looking more broadly at what's happened you know, to the economy, are the British people poorer as a result of what we're going through right now? Well, I think we have to be careful with the choice of words here. What we've had is, because so much of this inflation is, is coming from external sources, and, and there are, you know, there's two huge shocks been going on in the world. We've had the largest, you know, the biggest global pandemic for 100 years. We've had, sadly, well, both of them are sad, we've had the largest war in Europe since the Second World War. Now, th that has caused an increase in the price of things we import. Now, all of this is bullshit, and you've got to love the reporter because he's going to throw it right in his face. Oh, you guys are just saying uh, supply chains, Putin. Watch the reaction on Andrew Bailey's face. Take a look. But the final thing, uh, you know, today you're talking about the fact that food price inflation has been higher than expected. You've had to upgrade, or yeah. raise your inflation forecast. Before it was, you know, Putin, before it was energy. People are looking at the bank, they're looking at your inflation forecast and they're saying you keep getting it wrong. I mean, is, is the simple truth here that basically the bank isn't very good at forecasting? I don't agree with that. Um, I, I want to be very clear that we are having, you know, we're experiencing huge external shocks coming into, and we're not alone in this. I mean, other countries obviously have got the same situation. Those external shocks are, you know, frankly, not something you can forecast as such. I'm things, things like the war. Something like the war, you can't but, forecast but, wars. But the bank was missing its forecast before the war. It was missing its forecast before the big, the big rise yes, in because gas there was because there was an impact from in COVID. In 2021. There was an impact from COVID. On, on, on what we tend to call supply chains, on, on, on the supply of... Okay, so now he's just weaseling his way around. Oh, it's the war. Nobody can predict the war. Uh, nobody can predict Putin. And the reporter says, no, 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 this has been happening before Putin. This has been happening before the war. And he goes back, oh, yeah, it's because of the thing. The pandemic uh, disruptions. If it's not Putin, it's the pandemic. If it's not the pandemic, it's Putin. They can't take responsibility and say, yeah, we f***ed up. We made a mistake. And this is how we're going to solve it. But they can't say that because they're way too late to the game. The gap is huge. It is almost impossible to take this inflation down in Britain without causing a depression. So what is the solution now? Well, according to the BOE, when all else fails, you got to cook the data. Andrew Bailey now says with confidence that, oh, inflation is going to go down dramatically in the next reading. Well, how do you know that? You're only going to know that if you're cooking the data at a time. Take a look. Well, we do think that inflation is going to fall quite rapidly, almost from, sort of, well, from the next release onwards, which is due in two weeks. And the reason for that you is... You did think that last time. Well, well, I, I, no, not rapidly. We, we did think that some more was going to come out, but the, the, rapid, the rapid sort of fall starts... It's a rather mechanical point, but it's the big annual increases of this time last year that start to fall out of the annual calculation. It's really to do with energy prices and to wait and to the way the off-gen process worked a year ago. So that's yeah, that's the thing that's going to change, and that doesn't happen until the, the April data, which will come out um, in, in, in a couple of weeks' time. So that's 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 what we expect to happen. The economy has been more resilient. I think that's that's good news. I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, Energy prices, of course, have come down a lot, which has eased the cost of living from that point of view. Um, fiscal policy is more supportive after the budget, and the world economy is more supportive. China's got out of its you know, zero COVID policy with less disruption than we feared. So there's some good news there. And folks, the bottom line is 
the British consumer will have to endure more and more pain and live under the illusion that the inflation problem has been resolved, that inflation is falling rapidly, when in reality it's not. But the Bank of England is out of ammo, out of ideas, and out of solutions. And the last resort that they got is to manipulate the data and gaslight you, and brainwash you that, yeah, inflation is going down. Inflation is just imaginary. It only exists in your head. I mean, this is what we've done here in the US. We cooked the data and we convinced everybody that, yeah, inflation is gone, even though it's not. The inflation problem persists here in the US. Any rational human being who lives in real life understands that. The rents are not really going down. Food inflation is not really going down. The prices we paid the pump, they're not going down. Our utility bills, they're not going down. Our insurance costs are actually moving higher. But we're told by the media and the Federal Reserve that, yeah, inflation is going down. It went down from 9% to 4.9%. And the British public is about to experience the same level of gaslighting. Oh, did we say that inflation was above 10%? Now watch this. Inflation magically went down to 5%. But somehow you're still paying more for rents, for gas, for petrol, for utilities. You know the deal. And with that, folks, we have reached the conclusion of this video. Once again, I hope you found it informative. And if you did, return the favor by subscribing, pressing the like button, the notification bell. And this is all I got for you for now. Once again, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. I have what you're looking for. I have the guns.